I want to begin by expressing my gratitude for those who responded to my September challenge. Have you seen the presiding bishopric's March financial update? If not, I encourage you to visit the web address on the screen. Today, I'll note some highlights of the March update. Worldwide mission ties exceeded our goal for November and December 2017. Thank you for your remarkable generosity. The number of congregations and mission centers contributing to worldwide mission and Bridge of Hope tithes is increasing. Thank you for your faithful, visionary community response. World Church net assets increased in 2017. A primary reason was a new appraisal of the Harmony Land. That appraisal was $18 million more than the one before. This change increased endowment balances. Certainly encouraging news. Last September, I emphasized the need to fund fully the church's retirement obligations. I announced a goal of $115 million as part of the Bridge of Hope project. Through individual, congregational, and mission center contributions, combined with net proceeds from the sale of the printer's manuscript of the Book of Mormon and other assets, the amount needed has been reduced to about $75.5 million. We also have received pledges for contributions of about $34.1 million to Bridge of Hope tithes. If all pledges are fulfilled, the retirement funding goal will be further reduced to $41.4 million. And we're not letting up. We will implement our plan of personal, congregational, and mission center contributions and pledges combined with net proceeds from real estate and historical assets sales until our goal is met. A word of caution, though. Our greatest obstacle is not the retirement funding obligation. It is increasing the number of people contributing regularly to both worldwide and local mission ties. Again, I urge all congregational leaders and priesthood members to model and teach the principles of a disciple's generous response and the importance of generosity as a regular spiritual practice for all ages and groups. Last September, I spoke about the possibility of a new mission funding model. In the presiding bishopric's March financial update, a plan was announced to introduce a revised model. Information about it is on the church's website, along with a survey for feedback. Watch for opportunities to discuss this model in your area, and please respond to the survey. A foundation of the proposed model is belief that congregations and mission centers benefit from a close relationship with the whole church. This occurs when groups learn more about our worldwide ministries and decide how they can evidence further our oneness in Christ's body and mission. Closely connecting local church life and global vision is essential to the community of Christ experience, an experience that enriches all members and seekers. As emphasized in Doctrine and Covenants 162, paragraph 4, listen carefully 
to the many testimonies of those around the world who have been led into the fellowship of the community of Christ. The richness of cultures, the poetry of language, and the breadth of human experience permit the gospel to be seen with new eyes and grasped with freshness of spirit. This gift has been given to you. Do not fail to understand its power. The multicultural character of the church is a powerful gift, vital to fully proclaiming and transmitting the gospel. I recently visited several congregations that are united in spirit and mission with the worldwide church. These congregations enjoy vibrant energy, enthusiasm, generosity, and positive purpose. I want all congregations to enjoy that kind of experience. It's a major part of the spiritual glue that binds us together as a church. World Conference is one way we experience the blessings of worldwide community. The next World Conference will be April 6th through the 13th, 2019. Our theme will be Discover. During the conference, we will discover our future as we explore opportunities and possibilities related to our common mission. The first weekend of conference will focus on the 25th anniversary of the temple's dedication. Activities will equip us to embody the ministries of the temple everywhere we live. I hope you are making plans now to participate in the 2019 World Conference. It will give us opportunity to discover anew our calling to become a prophetic community drawn from the nations of the world that is characterized by uncommon devotion to the compassion and peace of God revealed in Jesus Christ and to discover how we are answering that call. We are answering by shaping a church community that transcends walls of race, class, economics, and gender. We are answering by presenting an alternative, holistic vision of God's will for a peaceful creation. We are answering by living the spiritual principles of God's reign, which are radically different than prevailing attitudes and behaviors in many places. Knowing that community of Christ is answering the call gives me encouragement and hope. In my previous challenge, I talked about calling hope and possibility for the future. I observed that we are in the middle of massive cultural, social, spiritual, and religious shifts that are unavoidable. I stress that simply working harder at church as usual is not a long-term solution. Why? It's not about anyone's failure. Simply speaking, for a growing number of people, some aspects of what we are doing in church is more suited to a time that has passed. The Holy Spirit is, is doing a new work to enliven the essence of Jesus' message and ministry for a new era. In Beyond Resistance, the institutional church meets the postmodern world, John Dorhauer wrote, I believe that because the world has shifted so dramatically, the Spirit is birthing a new way of being church so the gospel message can be heard, received, and transmitted in ways 
the postmodern world can accept. Taking this and more into consideration, I proposed in my last address that the future church will be focused more on spiritual, relational, and missional growth and less on debating correct doctrine or maintaining organizational structures. The future church is being formed by a basic concept. Our chief purpose is to birth, nurture, and multiply communities of disciples and seekers engaged in spiritual formation and compassionate ministry and action. This basic blueprint, spiritual formation, community, compassionate ministry and action is true to the vision of Christ. Well, that statement stirred wide-ranging responses. And so I want to continue our conversation about the future by saying more about the statement. What is spiritual formation? For me, it means intentional, regular spiritual practices that bond us to the divine and shape us in the image of Christ. It is integrating our inner spiritual lives and outward actions to live in harmony with God's vision for creation. Evangelist Carolyn Brock observed, Spiritual formation is not something we do as a disciple. It is what shapes us into a disciple. It is a journey of becoming that must be intentionally chosen. Christian spiritual formation is the shaping of our lives, identities, and responses into those of Jesus Christ. Spiritual formation transforms the heart and mind. It blesses, reconciles, and spiritually enlivens disciples. They experience the mysterious but eternal truth affirmed in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 16, that Christ is all and in all, and that we should let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts as we live in communities of compassion and forgiveness. As we are spiritually formed in that kind of gospel community, we are motivated and equipped to bless our neighbors and neighborhoods through an overflow of compassionate ministry and action. The phrase compassionate ministry and action summarizes the intent of our mission initiatives. Invitations to experience God's love, efforts to abolish poverty and end needless suffering, and pursuing peace are what compassionate ministry and action arising from spiritual transformation are about. Forming such sacred community can be relatively uncomplicated and take place in many settings. It can happen in small groups, congregational groups, and online connections with occasional gatherings. It can happen in homes, storefronts, church buildings, and offices. It can occur at parks, on hiking trails, around dinner tables, in the temple, and any combination of these. There's not a detailed model or instruction booklet. The essential components are spiritual and community formation with a willingness to risk something new in our neighborhoods to express the already present reign of God. The spiritual truth underlying this is the call to incarnate the living Christ in us as continuing revelation of God in the world today. Meister Eckhart, a 12th century Christian mystic from Germany, 
asked, What good is it to me for the Creator to give birth to His Son if I do not also give birth to Him in my time and culture? This then is the fullness of time, when the Son of God is begotten in us. My hope rises with the realization that this truth is taking root and growing throughout the church. Some already are migrating to the future by engaging in spiritual formation practices and creating innovative ministries that embody this concept. It is exciting to see bold moves in response to the Holy Spirit. In closing, I would like to ask this question. When God dreams of community of Christ, what does God see? I think God sees a worldwide family bound together in the Spirit of Christ. I think God sees people experiencing all of the dimensions of salvation through positive witness and innovative ministries. I think God sees people and groups being spiritually restored through reconciled relationships to God, others, and the whole creation. I think God sees a spiritual movement that is creating hopeful alternatives to cultural, political, and religious trends that are contrary to the reconciling and restoring purposes of God. I think God sees us as we are and as we are becoming. And when God sees us, God sees hope for the world rising.